Welcome back to Rhetoric Warriors podcast. We are spreading some information out there about dealing with public communication and persuasion and how to how to maybe up your game a little bit. Complicated times require more sophisticated techniques. And I would say these are complicated times. Seems like the uh, discourse has changed with the rise of new modes of communication and such. So come on in, get get your learn on a little bit and uh, maybe pick up some new ideas. I'm Dr. Dan, American rhetorician, escaped professor. I'm also a late night comedy writer. So I tend to roam in different worlds. Uh, founder of Rhetoric Warriors, you can find me over at Substack, where I write on a lot of different topics about rhetoric, including persuasion for parents. If you'd like to apply some of this stuff to your children to make life easier, I'll, I'll talk to you about that. So here on the podcast, I do a few things. I talk to comedians about their politics and their careers, because that's always interesting. I do uh, conversions. So I will invite people on from very different perspectives than mine, and I will take them through my conversion process especially conservatives, because they worry me. Uh, and I, uh, I gather persuasion advice from academics and public persuaders and people with interesting expertises. And I would say that is today. My, uh, my guest, I, I read an essay that he had written in a uh, substack on persuasion, and it really interested me from the, the way that he was approaching sort of the history of freedom of speech, which goes right into the core of all the things that he talk about in rhetoric. So I thought I would ask him on today. Um, he's been all over the place. He's been a visiting fellow at um, a few different places in Washington, at the Individual Rights and in Education in Washington. Uh, he was in the Columbia's Global Freedom of Expression Center. And right now he's sitting in his home of Copenhagen or outside of Copenhagen. So welcome, Jacob Michikama. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to uh, be on. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, I, that's kind of the nice things about social media is you can sort of find interesting people and kind of get to them and kind of get access. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, imagine uh, if uh, the great philosophers of uh, 100 or 200 years ago had, had had the uh, ability to sort of speak uh, as freely uh, and, and instantly as we uh, as we are able to do now you know so uh, we, yeah. we take it for granted we take it for granted but you know uh, if people would be sort of uh, thinking we, we live in some kind of dream world with the ability that we have you know sitting on two different continents and able to uh, engage in what will hopefully be an uh, interesting uh, conversation yeah i think that's a great point i mean i remember watching some of the early in the 70s when people would start bringing on Foucault and you know people like that to have small debates or at least discussions and after having read all that and then actually seeing these guys talk it's just a completely different dimensionality to the information and the way that they communicate it yeah 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 yeah, yeah. and and you know <clears throat> this is uh, I suspect one of the things that we'll discuss you know how does new communications technology affect um, sort of the ecosystem of information and opinion uh, and, and what should we, you know, does that alter how we should think about freedom of expression, you know, is it a, is a force for good or bad? And, and I think in, in, uh, in our culture, at least it's sort of in, in open Western democracies, we tend to focus very much on the negative sides and on the bad things, and we tend to take all the, uh, the benefits for granted. Uh, and I think uh, that, that's one of the things that that um, that I hope to warn about, and uh, perhaps we can talk about that. I have a, a book coming out on, on the history of free speech coming out in February. So, so that's that's an, an, an important part of the, what, what, you know what I think about yeah, when I when when I think about free speech and and, and use historical lessons uh, and try to apply them to our challenges today. Yeah, when you stretch it out and you start to look at it across eons and across cultures and all these different locations, this concept gets really pliable. You know, in some places, in, it's like you, you sort of said there at the beginning, it, it can be made to seem highly negative. It can be made to seem highly positive. And in rhetoric, that's just epideictic games of praise and blame. Like, how do you drag it over to the positive or the negative? And to, to see it, you know, this discussion of, these two polarities of freedom of speech because they're both there right there's clear harms that can be found in in free speech and there's clear goods and so it's it's not a clean debate 
Yeah, no, uh, I would say, you know, um, uh, some free speech defenders will say, you know, sticks and stones and, uh, and, and that, but, but I think it doesn't make sense to try to argue that, you know, speech can never be harmful. Of course, speech uh, can be harmful. Um, but in, in sort of, in my view, the, the, the benefits have uh, historically, and even today, I would say, uh, sort of significantly outweighed uh, the, uh, the the harms, and also I think uh, <clears throat> we 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 think so much about the harms of free speech now is because they've become much more visible uh, and they've been amplified because of social media. So before you know, <clears throat> um, yeah, before be, before you had big centralized platforms, um, you would you would not. Typically, you know, unless you you sort it out, you would pay, maybe not uh, encounter uh, white supremacy or you know sort of extreme ideologies. They would be sort of hidden on, on specific corners of the internet where where you where you would meet them. But today, you can you know you you can be confronted by online trolls uh, and, and and so on. So you see the harms much more than than you than you did before, where you had a um, uh, a, a much more, uh, you could say, uh, privileged or, or elitist free speech uh, sure. environment where you had sort of institutional gatekeepers uh, in, in professional journalists, editors, and, and there was a sort of a, a certain class that, that framed um, what was being said in, in the public uh, debate. Of course, ordinary citizens also had the right to speak, but it would be very difficult for an ordinary person to speak to a larger audience, uh, and, and uh, you know they would have to, uh, you know, uh, have their their say accepted by an editor, uh, and, and that would require a specific format, or they would have to be invited on on TV or uh, or, or the like. Um, I, but I think you know it's, it's also I think, and, and I think we tend to sort of look back sometimes, sort of uh, misty eyed at the days where everyone you know where there was. A certain narratives that most most people shared, and, and and you know we knew what was right and what was wrong, but I also think you know if <clears throat> probably a, a lot of a, a lot of the things that we um, that we accepted as truths and as the narrative of what was being reported in the New York Times or the Washington Post, you know, if other voices had been allowed to to share in the conversation the way they did today, we would maybe have very different perspectives of what was being and what was being reported. Uh, so, so it was it was partly because you know there were only a few institutional actors that could actually frame what was being said before that uh, that 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 it. It, it sort of came across as the truth uh, about what was being uh, reported. Yeah, it's an interesting issue, right? Like how much, it's almost a receiver issue. How much free speech can you, can you take? Can you absorb before it becomes cacophony, before it becomes sort of this avalanche and onslaught of different perspectives and people end up just shutting down? Because you see this a lot now on social media where people are I've had I don't know 50 friends in the last couple of months who say I'm I'm getting off social media and that's become yeah. a you know a, a a way of adapting to this because it is just so many voices you know the the that's new that's never been available before yeah no no absolutely you know there's an, a complete information overload and also you know if you want to research any given topic, you know, you can find, uh, <laughs> you know, um, you don't have one authoritative uh, source, so it becomes more difficult to um, to sort of find the truth. And it becomes much easier for sort of for bullshit merchants to, to sort of uh, contest truth. And, uh, uh, and, and, and we see that, of course, with, with COVID and, you know, the, the election, uh, <laughs> the latest presidential election, and it's contestation in in in, uh, in in the US uh, and, and, and the same phenomenon uh, in many other places uh, uh, of the world um, I think you know um, there's a there's a um, there's a French uh, academic called Hugo Mercier who, who's, who's written a, a great book um, 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 now I forget the title but he he basically argues that that people are not as gullible 
uh, as we're sometimes, uh, as, 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 as you know, the narrative in, in media and so on will, will sometimes have us believe. He, he says that we actually have evolved with something that he, I think he calls um, an open vigilance. The, the, book, the book is called Not Born Yesterday. I, I, I really recommend it. Uh, and, and I think, you know, so if you look at, for instance, uh, trust, there's no doubt that there's been sort of a collapse in trust in, in political institutions, in, in, in media, uh, and so on. But still, in many countries, um, you will see that people have uh, more faith in traditional media, in information on traditional media, than they do uh, have faith in, in information on social media. And I think, you know, uh, that, that's that's a healthy sign. Not that all traditional media outlets are uh, are, are perfect or uh, don't engage in in sort of uh, misinformation and, and so on. But 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 I think that shows that people are not just uh, buying into um, the first narrative that they encounter on social media. And and fortunately, we also see a lot of research about you know the. The, um, the share of hate speech and disinformation on, on social media, even though uh, the stories about <clears throat> misinformation on, on social media takes up a lot. And, and, and although the, the absolute number of, of, of pieces of content that include misinformation is obviously huge, it's actually a quite a limited share. Uh, so most people are, are not, you know, buying everything, but, but obviously th there's a very vocal minority um, that uh, actively in, engages in, in sharing and dissem disseminating um, hateful messages and, and misinformation. And, uh, and unfortunately, they take up uh, a lot of our debate and they can have, you know, even though they're the actions of a, of a minority, uh, they can also ultimately lead to, uh, to, to quite harmful consequences on the ground. Yeah, it becomes a tangle, right? Very quickly. Like this is a very tangled communication environment, a lot of issues that, you know, end sure. up mixed up with each other. And when you look yeah. at it and try to clean it up in some ways, like part of my thing is I make a, a simple split in the brand that I do with rhetoric of calling it, uh, I teach or advocate ethical only rhetoric versus, you know, the techniques which could fairly be, be fairly easily labeled as unethical rhetorical techniques. and that split at least allows people to intellectually cleave this massive storming of words and talk and parties and everything else, and at least do, you know, a beginning delineation between technique. So it gets that out there. It gets the idea that there's probably positive technique and negative technique, and there's a list of techniques which are acceptable and not acceptable. And it's, it's completely, you know, a definitional uh, play to try to get people to at least intellectualize the public discourse in some way. And I think that's what's mm -hmm. interesting about like, you know, when I read the description of your book, the reviews of your book that are that's coming out, even taking it down through history, like you're doing, and across cultures, gives people a new perspective, a meta perspective on, like you said, what we take for granted here in the United States, of course, you can say whatever you want, you know, which is definitely not true down through history or across cultures. Yeah, yeah, no, uh, um, I, I think that's, um, I think that's right. You know, you know, the history of free speech to me, um, you know, at, at a, it, uh, you know, on a, from a certain perspective, I think you could have sort of a short term and a long term perspective. So in the long term perspective, we're living in an absolute golden age of free speech. So, you know, in the US, um, the legal protection of free speech has probably never been greater. So the, the US Supreme Court affords a very, very high degree of protection of speech, even very sort of extreme and, 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 and controversial speech. So, uh, so it's very narrow categories of, 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 uh, of opinion that can, that can, be, uh, it can be limited by, by, um, by public officials and, and, and the federal government and state governments and, 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 and so on. Of course, you have uh, challenges in the culture in, in the US. Um, we, we see that both uh, from, from the left uh, and the right, but also just in, in terms of, of the digital age, you know, it's never been easier for people to just uh, impart and receive uh, information in, in ways that would have been unfathomable uh, not long ago. 
uh, but I think in uh, you know from the the short term perspective, I still think that we're probably in the decline of a golden age in the sense that in the past 10, 15 years, governments have adopted ever more restrictive uh, laws uh, against against free speech. And also sort of, even though the internet and social media uh, were supposed to sort of in the most techno utopian uh, civil libertarian, civil libertarian ideals that 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 sort of um, guided the early internet pioneers and even social media companies like like Twitter and Facebook initially, they have sort of hit the the, the brick wall of of reality where where um, they sort of come to realize that you know it's it's quite difficult being a platform with uh, billions or hundreds of millions of, of users with very different. Um, uh, ideas of what free speech is and what where the, the line should should be drawn, and so these platforms have uh, come to um, prioritize uh, sort of safety uh, um, of, of their users rather than uh, rather than free speech, and and that means that at the practical level, um, we see free speech being increasingly limited, even uh, limited by. By uh, by private companies, uh, and we also see it, of course, at at universities uh, and colleges. We see it um, even among publishers, uh, so on, where controversial uh, cultural ideas, the groups can cause you know a, a loss of of, uh, of, of livelihood. Um, and of course, we see authoritarians on the march all over the world. And you know, from <clears throat> from 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 you know, I, I date free speech back to the Athenian democracy some twenty five hundred years ago. And there you see that when the Athenian democracy was overthrown, um, the very first uh, victim was free speech. And that is exactly the you know, it's 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 one hundred and one in the dictators or the authoritarians uh, playbook that the very first. Thing you want to crack down on is is free speech. You want to control uh, the f- the flow of information. You want to ensure that that no one can challenge uh, you in in the public uh, sphere. Uh, and 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 we see that with China as, as as the most prominent example. We see it with Russia. We see it with India. We see it in, in Hungary. Even in Europe, we see it in Poland. But we even see it in liberal democracies as well. Uh, increasingly, there's, there's a, a narrowing space for. For free speech, so that's that's the decline of the of the golden age of uh, of free speech that I'm that I'm talking about, uh, and that's what sort of has, has motivated me to to write uh, the the book. So, what training do people get in this? Like, I know in America, like it it's simply part of the culture; people use it or they don't. But you know, the the idea that there's so many different ways of setting up free speech, right? So you can do it where there's zero policing at all. There's some kind of mid-range policing, which what a lot of people culture seem to be, or total policing, where you totally set up rules and there's a very hardened structure and everybody has to learn these and the consequences, usually from a government, you know. But I, I was a professor for 20 years, so I, there was there were clear speech restrictions within the norms of the institutions I worked for, even though they didn't come right out and say them, they were there. So there was always policing. So within that system of unpoliced versus totally policed, and we seem to you know move around there in the middle quite a bit. Where do you land on that? Like, are you, is this sense of like, the best things that you've seen are just completely unpoliced systems? Is that is that viable? Is that what you would... No, I don't. I don't think. Um, well, I, I would say that in general, my take from some sort of the history of free speech is that sort of decentralized authority, when it comes to free speech, tends to be a very strong. Uh, tr- tends to create a fertile ground for 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 free speech. Um, um, so, a good example of that could be sort of the golden age of the Dutch Republic in the. Uh, in the in the 17th uh, century, so there was no sort of uh, there was no constitutional protection or laws that protected free speech. But because the Dutch 
uh, 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 Republic had a, uh, a, a, a number of states that competed with each other and had different uh, rules. Uh, uh, that, that, that so that was a very very weak um, central authority, which which just allowed uh, a practice of free speech, and and therefore uh, the Dutch Republic became sort of the printing house of, of Europe, uh, and, and lots of, of printers could print that would not be allowed in book uh, to Europe. So, uh, so, so that's a good example of sort of decentralized authority. You know, I, I do think that that there should be uh, rules uh, and, and uh, you know, uh, free speech would be undermined if the police did not take seriously and the legal system did not take se seriously, for instance, threats. Um, you know, if, uh, if, if threats were a perfectly acceptable <laughs> Uh, remedy in the public debate, you know, someone writes something you, you, you don't like and, and it was legal to say, uh, I'll kill you, uh, then that obviously would undermine the very uh, ideal and, and practice of free speech um, and, 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 you know, incitement uh, to violence. And, you know, speech can be used in a, in a lot of ways that are harmful, you know, embezzlement, fraud, you know, you, you could come up with, with numerous examples, but these are also um, examples where, 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 where speech has a very clear nexus to some tangible harm. Um, and, and, uh, and, and that's where I tend to think the, the line should be drawn. That's not always crystal clear where the, where the, line, the line should, should be drawn, but, but what I tend to oppose strongly is the, the regulation of Sort of mere opinions. So I think that then voicing opinions, no matter how odious, uh, should be uh, should be allowed. So so for instance, I would not criminalize Holocaust denial, even though Holocaust denial is almost by definition, uh, you know, a tool of sort of neo Nazis who use it uh, as a quote unquote clever way to sort of. Uh, to, to, to engage in, uh, in intelligent anti-Semitism and, and sort of rehabilitation of, of the crimes of, of, uh, of the Nazis. Um, but if you were, like if you were uh, so, say, so, but, but go ahead, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. I was gonna say, so let's create a hypothetical system where you're, you're the czar of free speech, okay? So I, I've yeah. talked about this sometimes, like I think one of the roles of rhetoric is to be like guardians of the galaxy for public discourse, because rhetoricians come, become very high, highly attuned to all the issues that you're talking about, sort of how language works in the world, right? And so mm -hmm. you should turn to people like that <clears throat> to make some of these decisions. Governments aren't really qualified to make these decisions. Governments are hijackable. You know, all these systems that you're talking about, like everybody would probably agree that inciting tangible harm or threats and things like that should be restricted in public speech. But as soon as you put that in there, then nefarious elements can come in and just claim that what you just said was a threat to them. You're seeing this all the time in the unethical practices of the right. So if you were the czar of this, like I think rhetoricians can tell fairly easily ethical versus unethical, harmful versus un uh, non-harmful rhetoric, right? And I would imagine you probably could too. I, I would not trust myself to be the sort of free speech. So I, I think my principles on free speech are pretty good and, and pretty well informed, but undoubtedly my biases uh, and sort of just having the, the power to, to sort of come down on, on one side or the other, I would use them uh, to 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 benefit and privilege my <laughs> my side of, of various debates because t humans have a great tendency to you really wouldn't uh, trust yourself. You don't think that you would be a you've got no, to be one of the one of the world's no, most I don't. most educated people on free speech. Yeah, but, so you would you would be a great yeah, that, that, you know but, but, candidate but for czar. Yeah, but I don't think, like I said, I think free speech thrives when when it you know there's decentralized authority, not when when so you know that that's a great you know we have examples of this. So you know in the 18th century, when when the Enlightenment really got a foothold, you had these um, enlightened absolutists. Uh, they've been called so, like Frederick the Great and Katharina the Great, 
who, um, who, who, you know, they were absolute rulers. Frederick was the absolute ruler of Prussia and Catherine was the absolute ruler of Russia, but they were sort of smitten with enlightenment ideals and, and with uh, enlightenment thinkers, including sort of radical enlightenment thinkers from France who really challenged uh, prevailing uh, ideas of of, uh, of religion, but also uh, but, but also uh, 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 politics, and 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 so both um, Frederick, who called himself a philosopher king, and 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 Catherine, sort of tried to cultivate, um, sort of marry the idea of of absolutism with enlightenment, which included sort of opening up the space for free speech uh, and debate. But they were never uh, able to sort of, uh, they were never willing to sort of completely let, let, let go of the inherent conflict and tension between free speech and the fact that they were absolutist rulers uh, who, who, who got to, to, uh, to decide everything. So whenever their position was challenged, uh, you know, they'd, they'd, they'd uh, have butts to, to free speech. And I'm sure if, 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 if I'd been given those powers, you know, I could come up. I, I would come up with uh, with buts, and I would be able to convince myself with very uh, sophisticated, um, uh, beautifully written words that this or that opinion was really harmful. It might not seem like it was a deviation of the principles that I have previously espoused, but because of this specific argument, uh, I could justify it. So, so I don't think that yeah, but you're, po person... you're positing the corrupted you, not the best you, right? Yeah, but all human beings are are, are corruptible. I think, I think, uh, uh, I think, uh, I think we're, we're, you know, I don't, I simply don't believe any uh, one person um, with, with all that power. I think it, would, it takes, you know, superhuman uh, powers to 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 keep your, your path clean when you were given those kinds of powers. So I, would, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't want those kind of, of powers. Uh, of course, uh, it might be better to have me uh, given those superpowers than, uh, uh, than, than, than others who, <laughs> who, who, would, uh, who, would, who would have no hesitation ab about you know, imposing hardcore restrictions. But, right. but, but so I don't like, think- Like right now, like Zuckerberg and you know, all these tech giant guys, tech founders are essentially playing that role in their massive universe. So he's got the metaverse now and he's playing yeah. the, the dictator of free speech. What's allowed but and what isn't. A, that, I'd that, rather have you yeah. there than him. But, but, but again, this is a good example. So Twitter uh, used to call themselves the free speech wing of the free speech party. And I think, you know, since I think they sincerely believed, you know, in, in Silicon Valley that they would sort of create <clears throat> these um, these 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 platforms that would be informed by sort of First Amendment ideals and, and American free speech ideals, uh, and then you know, then suddenly you know, you become listed. You have shareholders. You have right. pressure. You have to satisfy politicians of one stripe of another stripe. You have you know, you've got pressure from NGOs. Uh, and so on, and then you you know your your principles become flexible uh, because uh, you you realize that free speech you know cannot be the only uh, guiding principle for a a, a, a a company that is ultimately uh, whose whose main mission is is is, is profits. Um, so capitalism so is destroying free speech. No, I, I, I wouldn't say that ca capitalism is destroying free speech. I would certainly say that the capitalist countries uh, have a much stronger uh, record on, on free speech than, than the socialist uh, ones. I, I don't think there's ever been a country um, that so systematically denied free speech as, as the Soviet Union, especially especially during Stalin, but already commencing under, under Lenin. I, I think quite likely uh, Stalin was more uh, censorious than than even than, than Hitler, uh, um, even though Hitler was certainly no fan of, of free speech. Um, so well, he so, was busy so with I other would, things. He was he was busy repressing other things. He was busy, but but you know Stalin uh, Stalin was also uh, quite fond of of repressing various. But, but Stalin St Stalin is 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 interesting because he basically served as a as a censor himself. So he would sort of spent hours sort of pouring through 
draft articles and, and manuscripts and, and screen films. And then he would give sort of friendly advice to editors and, uh, and, write, and writers. And then, you know, you'd, uh, you'd better accept his advice if you cared about, you know, your career, your liberty and ultimately your life. Because if you didn't, you, you could ultimately end up in some gulag or with a bullet in, in the back of your head. Um, um, so, so I, so, 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 capitalism can uh, undermine uh, free speech um, because profits don't always go hand in hand with, with, uh, with, 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 with free speech. But I wouldn't say that that, that capitalism is inherently in, in conflict with uh, free speech. It can also enhance it in in, in some ways. Well, don't you think those guys? And this again, why I keep dragging, I'm going to keep dragging you back onto the throne uh, as the czar of free speech. Those guys are in over their heads. They don't get the kind of training in the background that you do, that you have from, you know, doing the research and thinking about this for years and years and having discussions like this. So we have people, and this is one of the, I, I found very interesting, especially in business, people making decisions outside their area of competence. You know, Zuckerberg is in no yeah, way competent <laughs> to make this decision. No, and, 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 and you know, it is essentially no one really is. So my organization, uh, we did, um, so last year, uh, no, actually earlier this year in June, I think, we, um, we, we, we published a survey of, of attitudes towards free speech in 33 countries across the globe. And, and what you'll see is that when you talk, when you ask people around the world whether they think free speech is an important value, I think something like 94% will say yes, and, and that people should have the right to say what they want. But then when you ask them about specific questions, you see huge differences uh, between different countries uh, based on, uh, on culture, religion, uh, geography, and also within uh, uh, certain countries. So you generally see like Scandinavian countries and the US are the most, the populations in those countries are the most speech protected. So they will, they will say that free speech should include the right to offend minorities and offend religion. But in a number of countries like, uh, say, Pakistan, Russia, Kenya, very, very few, you know, a, 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 a tiny minority will accept uh, free speech like that. So, so there is no sort of, uh, you know, so, so, you know, where do you come down on this? And, and that's the problem with these centralized platforms is they want to cater to the whole world, but people across the world have very, very different ideas about what free speech should be. So where do you set the line? You know, should it be in Denmark and Sweden and Norway? Uh, who, who get, should, should it be our sort of uh, uh, tolerance threshold, which is very, very high? Um, or should it be, you know, people in, in Russia and Kenya uh, who you know who 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 have uh, very different uh, ideas about what what's the proper role of free speech and 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 when you you know so you cannot satisfy everyone and that's why I think that free speech is ultimately not served by these you know centralized uh, platform. I think social media would benefit from a much more decentralized model, sort of a, a, a bit like going back to the original uh, internet, or at least sort of like the blogosphere, you know, it, it, when, when blogs were sort of all the rage, you know, no one cared if you had sort of a neo-Nazi white supremacist blog that had 50 or 100,000 uh, people reading it because that would just be sort of a tiny community. It wouldn't, you know, it wouldn't pop up everywhere, uh, it, you know, um, and so they could just have that corner of, of the internet uh, to, them, to themselves. Um, but now when we have sort of uh, centralized platforms whose, whose, whose terms and, and community standards sort of define uh, global, uh, uh, you know, the, the limits for, for, for global conversations and, and the sharing of information uh, across most countries in the world, that becomes much more uh, problematic because ultimately there is no ideal that will satisfy everyone. That, that simply does not exist because we don't have the same ideas about where free speech should be. You don't even have that uh, in the U.S. because of, of you know, even though the U.S. is one of the most um, has has one of the most um, you know speech protective populations in the world, you can still see a lot of the division and polarization that your country is suffering from now on issues on on free speech. So if you're a 
if you're a, a liberal progressive Democrat, you'll be more open to the idea that, uh, uh, you know, that, that minorities sh uh, should be protected uh, from, from hate speech, for instance, you'll be more open to, 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 to hate speech being, uh, being prohibited uh, by the government. Whereas if you are a, 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 um, a nationalist conservative, you will say that free speech uh, should not protect uh, the burning of the flag, for instance, uh, or now, as we see in, in several states, sort of uh, uh, critical race theory, you know, uh, we believe in free speech, but <laughs> a critical race theory that should be uh, that should be banned at least in schools and and, and, uh, and colleges. Uh, and and uh, uh, so, so you so you, so even in a country like the U.S., where you know free speech is sometimes celebrated as sort of a a, a secular article of faith, even even though in reality, you know, the 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 the, the American legal protection of free speech is a, is a relatively recent phenomenon uh, and, and there's been lots of, of censorship and repression throughout the history of the US, um, then you, you, you see that, uh, that, that polarization and, 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 and division is reflected in what's free speech uh, among Americans. Yeah, so people, so there's the, the push to try to come up with universal, ideas that apply to free speech, right? Like if you were to, to recommend here, are my top five things that I think make for a healthy free speech environment, like here are the anchors I would put into the world versus this idea that when you start going into the particulars, it, it all breaks apart. When you start going across other cultures, it all breaks apart. So how do you do a universalism? Cause I assume part of your expertise and the time you spent with this you've come up with ideas of your own, like here's what I think makes for a healthy functioning free speech system. Yeah, well, uh, you, know, I, you know, I think basically you have to <clears throat> go a bit behind, you know, the, the, the mere principle and say, you know, why even have free speech? What, 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 what is free speech good for? And, and I would argue uh, that, so, so one of the, in, in the US, for instance, one of the ideas that is challenging free speech from, from parts of the population that would previously uh, be, have, have been staunch uh, um, proponents of free speech is this idea that free speech is now being weaponized against minorities, uh, against oppressed groups, uh, and maybe against democracy itself. And, and, and that's why I would say, okay, so if you care, you know, if you care not just about freedom, but also equality and, and justice, and you say those values have to go hand in hand, then I would say, you know, okay, in, in which way has free speech impacted equality and justice? And, you know, if you go to American history, I don't think, you know, I think free speech has probably been one of the most crucial engines for equality. And, and that, you know, it's probably one of the, the most crucial uh, consequential engines of human equality that, that, that human beings have ever stumbled uh, upon. So if you go back to, let's go back to the 1830s, for instance, and uh, where you had um, abolitionist organizations in, in the North that started <coughs> petitioning and, and writing uh, sort of abolitionist um, pamphlets and mailing them to the South, sort of saying, you know, you know, this can't go on. We have to, you, you have to abolish this evil that is slavery. And how did, how did Southern states react? Well, they adopted probably the most speech restrictive laws in the history of, uh, of, of the United States. So in, in places like Alabama, and I think um, uh, one of the Carolinas, I believe, um, the, the, you, the, there was a death penalty for circulating um, abolitionist, uh, abolitionist tracts. Uh, and, and sort of even sort of possessing it uh, or, or sharing abolitionist ideas would, would be uh, would, would, would be prohibited. Uh, and of course, one of my favorite one of my favorite free speech proponents was the great orator and uh, who was born a slave, Frederick Douglass, uh, who who who, uh, who escaped uh, slavery and became sort of a very prominent abolitionist uh, orator and, and journalist. And um, and and he said. Um, in, in a very memorable speech, uh, 
that the right to, to free speech is very important, especially for the oppressed. So he saw sort of a very clear, he saw a, a very clear connection between free speech uh, and equality and, and the emancipatory power of free speech. And I think you saw, you see that also with someone like, like Ida B. Wells, who was maybe one of the most brave journalists in, in the history of, of the US. So she's a black woman who, who, who in the South sort of exposes uh, lynchings and, and reports about them uh, and, and, and has a newspaper that is, that is ultimately burnt uh, to the ground and she has to flee to the North because she's exposing this lie that uh, the reason why, why African-American men are being lynched is uh, what this is the white sort of trope is that they are raping white women. And, and so she exposes this uh, through her incredibly brave journalism. So that's the power of free speech. You see it with the civil rights movement who in one of the reasons why free speech is so strongly protected in the US today is because the civil rights movement went on this, this, the, the, this uh, spree of, of landmark decisions that they won at the Supreme Court culminating with New York Times versus Sullivan in, in 1964 um, uh, that greatly expanded the protection of free speech which empowered the, the civil rights movement to openly protest um, the gross injustices of, of Jim Crow uh, laws you, and and you know it's the same with British colonialism. So someone like Gandhi was sentenced to six years in prison. He he gave a great speech during his trial where he really stood up for the principle of free speech and went against these British sedition laws that the the British used to 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 shut down anti colonialist movements. You saw it in 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 apartheid South Africa, which which used a whole battery of laws of censorship and repression. To, uh, to 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 try and quell the anti-apartheid movement, and, and just before winning the the uh, the first free presidential election in uh, in '94, um, Nelson Mandela gave this great speech where where he lauded the idea of, of free speech and how how um, how um, the, the the free press in in democracies had given a voice to those anti-apartheid activists who who would, who could not speak their mind in, in in South Africa and how that had helped. Uh, bring about the the the, um, the 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 end of of apartheid. So 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 if you really believe in in inequality, uh, and if you're concerned about minorities, I would say free speech is the very first right that you should be concerned about because it has always been uh, the most important uh, weapon for for those who are oppressed, and it uh, and it has always been. The, the preferred tool of the oppressor and the supremacist. So, so and, and yeah. Yeah, I was gonna say, so then does the issue, like I think everybody would agree that free speech is, is a super weapon, it's a super tool for the oppressed and for people who need to get perspectives out. So is the problem then like it's, when good people use it, it's fine, but then when bad people come along and use it, it becomes not fine. Because even free speech, like I know with what's going on a lot right now with dark money and politics and the Supreme Court saying giving money is free speech from a corporation, mm -hmm. that is that is completely opened up a vulnerability in democracy here where, you know, because they warped the definition, I think of free speech uh, and let bad people use, hide behind the power of, you know, the protection of it. So is that the issue? Like, yeah, there are good things and bad things can be done with this, but really it comes down to are good people using it or bad people using it? Yeah, one of the problems with that is, of course, that some of the people that we law today were very bad at, at, their, at, uh, at that time. Uh, and that's why they were subject to uh, all kinds of, of censorship and repression. But, 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 it is unavoidable, you know. So, so if you believe in in, in principled, robust free speech protections that I do, as I do, uh, and I say, uh, well, these are crucial for minorities, then someone might say, well, um, well, how, how is that, how, how how is that when white supremacists are allowed to to march through the streets uh, and spew uh, their hatred because this will undermine uh, um, the, the the equality uh, of 
of, of, of uh, minorities and, and, and this is uh, harmful to them. Um, and I would not deny that sort of, uh, that hate speech, you know, you know, speech is difficult to define. That's one of the problems with policing it um, because it's a very flexible tool in the hands of, of, of authorities. Um, but I would not deny that harm speech can be harmful in a number of ways. So it can be harmful and, and disproportionately uh, hurtful to, to minorities that, that are targeted and might feel more vulnerable. Um, so, so there can be sort of uh, psychological, uh, emotional harms from, from being subjected to hate speech. And, and ultimately, you know, even though I think the correlation between hate speech and hate crimes is quite tenuous, um, but, but, you know, it would be impossible to organize side or a program or, or the like without speech. Speech is, is a necessary component for demonizing uh, groups before before people set upon them. Um, but I think uh, but I think the pro the, 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 the problem uh, is one as I mentioned uh, the definition. So so um, uh, how if you if you allow the government to police hate speech, you know if, imagine in the US imagine I don't want the government doing it. I want you doing it. Not, yeah, but but I think that's that's ultimately uh, I think that's ultimately what is is the strongest uh, is the strongest weapon that is showing solidarity, and that's why also in in my book uh, towards the end I I say that you know if you believe that free speech even hate speech should be protected um, by free speech standard you have a moral obligation to use your own speech rights to counter racism and hate speech and extend solidarity to those who are targeted by hate speech, uh, because otherwise it, it becomes a bit gratuitous just to say, well, yes, free speech, but so you also have to show, um, uh, and, and I think there are a number of strategies that I that, that, that are much more effective than, 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 uh, than government uh, repression. I show, for instance, in my book that in, 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 in Weimar, Germany, Sort of from 1918 to 1933, uh, there was a there was an sort of increasingly draconian laws that were being used both against Nazis and, and communists. Uh, you know, from confiscation of newspapers to banning Hitler from speaking in public to um, uh, sentencing uh, Nazi editors to 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 jail to sort of uh, only allowing government friendly broadcasts on the radio and and and. And ultimately, the Nazis used the the very provisions in the in the constitution that were supposed to protect democracy uh, to to subvert the, uh, democracy. Um, so, so I, I I think this idea of of militant democracy, where where democracy says no, there are limits to what you can say and how opposed to to democratic values you can be. I think that's that's a dangerous. Uh, that is, uh, is a road. But you know, there's so um, in the US, you have the Westboro Baptist Church, which is this group of uh, religious fundamentalist uh, clients who uh, used to show up at funerals of, of, of soldiers dead uh, uh, who, who had died in, you know, in Afghanistan and Iraq, and they would show up and shout sort of um, anti LGBT things and anti Catholic uh, things. And so at one point, a house became available across the street from the Westboro Baptist Church and someone bought it and, and painted it in sort of rainbow colors. So the LGBT flag, I, I thought that was a very, very a creative example of, of, uh, of, of using the power of speech and symbolism to, to counter hatred. Uh, there were some in, in Germany who also, so you had these neo-Nazis who were marching in the streets and unbeknownst to these uh, skinhead thugs who were, who, were, who were roaming around the streets in their march shouting hateful things, uh, this anti-racist organization that worked to de-radicalize the neo-Nazis had, had, um, had, had created this fundraiser. So for every, I think it was every kilometer or so that these Nazis marched, uh, donors would contribute an amount of money. And so when they showed up towards the end, these neo-Nazis, they showed these flags and posters saying, congratulations, you've just donated uh, X amount of euros to uh, an organization. That, that really is a way to humiliate um, uh, the, uh, the, the racist. But of course, it's also important that authorities, you know, even if authorities say, yes, 
you can say hateful things, but it's incredibly important that you then draw the line at intimidation and threats. So you're allowed to, um, to, to say uh, uh, hateful things, but you don't get to, but you don't get to, um, to, to uh, stand outside a, a mosque or a, a synagogue or, uh, or the like and, and, and shout death to the, to the Jews and, and the Muslims were sort of whipping up a, a, a crowd. Um, so your system and, would be then, it sounds like maybe creative countering, like, like everybody needs to take on a responsibility to protect free speech or keep it you know, as healthy as possible by countering what you consider to be you know, negative speech. Uh, but the government or whatever the reigning body is does have some responsibility for doing some kind of legal yeah, control, I, like a mix yeah, of those so, two uh, things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you know. I think you have to crack down on on threats. For instance, threats uh, is is a major impediment to to free speech. If if you know, as I think I, I mentioned earlier on, if you know, if you were free to just simply call your uh, a politician that you didn't like or some a journalist or a reporter and, and say, you know, if you keep writing negatively about um, this or that subject, I'm going to kill you or, you know, I'm coming after your kids, uh, then that would be a very efficient way to undermine uh, free speech and, and impose sort of a self-censorship uh, among those who are threatened. So that's something that really has to be policed uh, and vigorous. And, and I think especially in the, in the digital age, you know, I think there's a, because it's become so easy to, to threaten someone just by leaving a comment on social media or shooting off an email, um, uh, you know, I, th there might be this idea among people uh, that it's not so serious to, to, to threaten people online. But, but I think, you know, that, that's, that's one issue where I think you, we have to be vigilant about you know, policing uh, online content is, is sort of uh, threats. Right. But that becomes problematic too, right? Like I've seen this a lot with social media now where they, you know, they've set their bots to, to recognize certain phrases and certain terms. And, yeah, for sure. you know, like I, I've, I, I did a bunch of research. I get interested in different intellectual areas and then I research all the interesting trivia and background information about it and then marry it up with stand up and create one person shows. And one of the ones I did was Hitler because Hitler was such an odd moment in human history and such an odd character. And so I have a ton of Hitler jokes, you know, that, you know, they're from the right perspective, the correct perspective. I'm not, I'm not advancing Hitler, but whenever you mention Hitler on Twitter or Facebook, you can just feel the, you know, the bots coming on and going, is this, yeah. and they don't get irony. Yeah, no, and, and that's one of the, and again, I think that, again, that has to do with the fact that we have these very centralized platforms. So there's just no way, you know, even if Facebook and Twitter and YouTube limited, you know, even if they adopted sort of very speech protective terms that reflected Did we lose you? First Amendment standards, yeah. which is um, they would, you know, no amount of um, human moderators could keep up with, uh, with, with with the number of comments that would have to be moderated. So it's just in the nature, you know, content moderation at scale just requires automation. But at the same time, automation, you know, from a free speech perspective, is 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 not a great tool, um, just because you know, at at, at the current level of uh, of sophistication. They, it, it's difficult for them to get context uh, um, and, and, you know, irony. And, you know, for instance, if you are a minority group, you might use slurs uh, in a, as an sort of try to, 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 to use those slurs as a way to take away the sting of them. So, so, so. Um, yeah, it's literally, that's, uh, I mean, that's incredibly common in. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, and, and, and social media. So very often social media, um, will not get that, that it's being used, the slur is being used in such a way, or it might be in sort of an anti-racist organization sort of saying, oh, this, this person said this uh, to sort of expose someone bigoted uh, and, and social media and, and 
and the algorithm will not be able to figure out that it was used in such a way because it, it cannot sufficiently understand uh, context. Um, so so that's, that's a huge problem. And again, I think um, uh, it, it might be that automation at some point becomes better and more reliable than, than the humans who, who, who will develop them. I don't know, I'm not a computer scientist. Um, but I think, again, if we had a much more decentralized social media environment, it would not be so consequential because you would not, to the same extent, need to be dependent on, on, uh, on automated content moderation. Um, but at, at the same time, I also think, you know, that to a higher degree, you know, one, one way where you could try to have more decentralized um, content moderation is to allow people to, to be more in control of the content that, they, uh, that they're confronted with. And you could, for instance, Facebook could allow, so if you're someone who's very concerned about racism, you could say, okay, I'll have the, um, I'll, 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 I'll have some anti-racist organization create a filter and then I can sort of uh, use that. I can have, uh, I can apply that on Facebook. And so that will filter a lot of terms that I find to be racist, uh, but that does not apply to, uh, to everyone. That's just me, that's my preference. And someone might say, I'm very concerned about misogynism. There's a number of terms um, used by what I consider to be misogynist trolls that I do not want to be confronted with, so I'll apply that. So that would allow you know, more people to be in, in control and charge of what they're being conf confronted with without this being a centralized decision taken from the top and, and affecting everyone. Right, so everybody has individual censorship power. Yeah, and I think that's perfectly, uh, I think that's perfectly compatible with, with free speech. So, you know, we all, we're all selective about speech. You know, you don't necessarily uh, accept uh, the friendship uh, of everyone on social media. You might uh, unfollow or delete friends. Uh, you might even block them if you think they're being, uh, if you be, think they're, they're being annoying. You know, you, every day you make decisions about uh, you know, am I going to read this newspaper or that newspaper, dependent on 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 the ideas and, and uh, that that are being reflected in in, in that newspaper, and, and the same with literature and, and films. So that that is is just part and parcel of free speech, and that's not problematic in in any way uh, because that's just you uh, using you know discriminating for yourself, but not uh, right. with effects for 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 everyone else. And I've made this point quite a bit to people because, again, doing stand-up, stand-up pushes the limits of what can be said. It likes to break taboos. It likes to explore shock and extremes. And um, my point to people a lot of times is you can say whatever you want. Like, I'm completely for free speech. I don't care how ugly it is. I don't care how extremist it is or anything else. I don't even care if it's threats and violence, stuff like that. What I care about is you can't force me to receive it. Like if you're just saying it over there, I'm, I'm fine with you and your orb, but like, you don't, I'm not giving you permission for it to reach me, you know? Yeah. So that's yeah. a lot of what I do when I curate my social media. I'm like, I accept no negativity in my, in my social media. If you want to laugh at the jokes, great. If you want to say something funny or, you know, uh, pr and praise of the jokes, great. No questions, no discussion, no debate. It's just a joke. Because I, I don't want those, that type of speech coming to me. And so I feel like I should have the power to determine that. And I think okay. that's what people lose a lot. Like, I think capitalism does this with advertising, with mass, you know, dispersive advertising. Politics does it right now with mass, you know, like the problem with Trump getting on Twitter was that everybody had to experience that. Suddenly he, he had a way of getting messages out to everybody, even people who didn't want to hear it. So empowering the individual to control their reception, I think is a really interesting area to look at. Yeah, yeah, and and, um, and and you know, obviously there are dangers in the sense that, you know, it could potentially lead to sort of filter bubbles and, and, and echo chambers, but you know, in, in a certain sense, it doesn't really differ conceptually from, you know, you know, do you prefer the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times, you know, it might be, yeah, you know, aesthetic choices very, at that point. Yeah. 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 And, and also, you know, you, you might, uh, 
say I really disagree with the uh, editorial line of the Wall Street Journal. I much prefer the New York Times. So, uh, so I'm I'm going to subscribe to the New York Times or vice versa. Um, and and you know you might want to watch uh, MSNBC and not Fox or the other way around. Um, and and uh, and 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 that's your that, that's your choice. But it becomes it becomes uh, more problematic uh, the the more centralized these decisions uh, right. become and. and well, and, and impacting sort of the ecosystem of, of, of information and, and opinion for, for a lot of people. Well, and I think part of my background has been entertainment, and that's kind of what I studied as an academic. Entertainment has dealt with a lot of this stuff for a long time and has come up with interesting solutions, like even the rating systems for films or the fact that films are so highly advertised with a poster and with trailers and things like that. So you can see what it is before you decide to actually go in and experience that message. And that's, that's literally like, you could do that with all free speech, like any, any group saying something like, Oh yeah, they're neo-Nazis and this is how they talk. And here's a little trailer of it. And here's a rating. If you want it, go get it. But if you want to avoid it, then you are empowered to do that. And I think entertainment, if you look at big media systems, you know, when you're trying to solve problems like that, like you don't, one of the problems stand-up has is people walk in a lot of times to a comedy club and they don't know the comedians that are going to be up there. And there's a, suddenly a big mismatch on profanity or topics. And you see people all the time will walk out of comedy clubs because they're offended by something. Whereas if there's a rating system that explained, hey, if you're coming in here, this is what you're going to get, they could have avoided it. And I think yeah, interesting yeah. things like that, like where you pull it from another, ec you know, ecology, another ec ecosystem would be interesting to add into uh, public, you know, general public discourse. Sure. I mean, again, if it was like, a, uh, I, I wouldn't be happy with the idea of sort of a, a centralized agency that should sort of label uh, things, even if you were allowed to, to, to read them. But, you know, but, but, but obviously, you know, um, the way that algorithms, for instance, on, on social media um, recommend things uh, is, is another thing, you know, um, the, one often criticism uh, against, um, against Facebook, for instance, is that their algorithms tend to reward in, in engagement and thus the most controversial stuff. I think probably it's a bit more complicated uh, than that, but 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 there, there, there's probably some uh, and a lot of, of, of truth to that. So it might be uh, it might be that Facebook has to think about you know can we um, can we have uh, an algorithmic uh, ranking system that maybe uh, does not just reward uh, engagement and mo the most sensationalist uh, content. Uh, that would not mean that this content is unavailable, but it would just mean that other forms of, of, of content um, would be more visible. Um, or if you could have some these, influence all, on it, right? Like, again, going back to the idea of the individual with power over their sure. messaging, and, like, and, I, and, I, I, here's, sure. here's 25 algorithms that we use, choose the one you want to use. Yeah. Like, and, right and now all, they're imposing and, and, an know, algorithm on us. Yeah. And, and, and I have to say, you know, each of these ideas and, and options probably open up a can of worms and, and include, you know, a whole list of, of dilemmas and, 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 and pros and cons. Uh, so, so, it, so I don't think there's any quick fix or, or easy of the digital age. Um, and, and uh, you know, if you go back to, to uh, look at what happened when the printing press was, was introduced, um, you know, the, these periods of, um, t tend to uh, um, create a lot of chaos and uncertainty. And, uh, and we have to learn how to navigate in, in, in the digital age according to sort of our analog brains and cultures and, and norms and, uh, and, and customs. And, and so maybe it's, it will be our grandkids uh, who come up with, uh, with a viable culture of, uh, of free speech and, and, and debate in, uh, for, for the 21st century. Yeah, it is fascinating the way the cultural communication technologies come in and just kind of just explode everything. Like all of a sudden, like, how do we do this? The fact that, you know, everybody remembers the day that Trump got detwittered because the silence fell over the entire world that it hadn't <laughs> been there for five years. I remember sitting going, oh, 
I'm not as upset today, you know, because that one voice had been pulled out of the, the you know, the world ecology. And that's yeah. a pretty amazing experience. Uh, that's never really been available like that before ever. Instant communication with pretty much the whole world from a, uh, a questionable source. So, well, cool, man. I, I appreciate you jumping on. I don't want to keep you too long. Uh, great discussion, as I figured. My pleasure. Um, I, uh, I I really enjoyed it. So uh, thanks for for having me on. Yeah, and tell people once again they can. Your, when is your book coming out, and when can they find that? Yeah, so my book is uh, Free Speech: A History from Socrates to Social Media. It will be out uh, published by Basic Books. It'll be out on February eighth, and uh, I will uh, be touring the U.S. Uh, for three weeks at least in in February. So. Uh, on, on the East Coast, um, mostly DC, New York, I think. Um, but so, so look out for it. Um, and uh, if you uh, if you live somewhere where I'll be speaking, uh, show up and uh, let's have a great discussion. Yeah, and show up and bring a big poster that says Jacob for Z for Czar of Free Speech. That's what <laughs> I want. <laughs> that's what I want to put forth out there. Well, like I said, great discussion. I appreciate it very much. Uh, this has been the Rhetoric Warriors podcast. Get out there and persuade people, engage. As always, we all need it. So do it.